just do it, it'll turn out okay. And welcome to the Devonian. Well, not now, it was back then, but <laughs> we're going to talk about it. Starting from the top, let's do our introductions. Uh, Who's on top? I, I guess I'm on top. Uh, okay. Hi, I'm uh, I'm Bree. I have the Brain Bug YouTube channel, and uh, we talk about bugs and insects. And uh, I've been invited here to uh, look at some of the uh, the arthropods of the Devonian period, which uh, was very dominated by uh, by Chelicerata and uh, and trilobites. So we'll get into that later on. But uh, thank you for having me on. All right, and below me is. Uh, I my name is Nestor Nick Vandy, but I but you can call me Ness for short. And I'm one of uh, Jackson Beats editors. Now well, I'm, I'm eager to see what he has to show about the Devonium, and also of course what Wilford has to sh show about the Devonium period. And speaking of Jackson, oh, I'm sorry, Brainbug. I'm going to disappoint you right out of the gate. I have exactly one slide about arthropods. Sorry, <laughs> um, I know letting everybody down. Uh, my name is Jackson Wheat. I have a YouTube channel of the same name. If you're interested in evolutionary biology and zoology, <laughs> go check that out because uh, we talk about lots of cool stuff over there. And down at the bottom, hey, the, as, the as the foundation of everything we're talking about here. Hey, I'm uh, Mr. Wilford. I'm, I'm just your, you know, a geology undergrad, and they uh, they invited me on here to talk about the Devonians' geology specifically today. Huh, nerd. <laughs> oh, from that, yeah, I, I look it up. You, you can make it full, or it says you can make it full screen by clicking something on the top right. Top right. Is that the, the right next to the X? Maybe. I, I, I look it up on the side. It says, in scan. I, it doesn't show. It just says in text, top right. Maybe, maybe transition or not. So on my on my copy of Google Slides, it just has a present button. So if that would make mm. it easier, I can just screen share. Okay. <laughs> All right. If that makes it a little less painless for everybody. Yeah. All right. I'll figure I'll figure it out eventually. <laughs> someday. The missing present button. <laughs> Wait just a second here. All right. Is that visible? Yes. Sweet. Yep. All right. Let's talk about the geology of the Devonian period. So first of all, we got to ask, what is the Devonian period? Well, it's a period in the Paleozoic, <clears throat> ranging from about 419 to 359 million years ago. It gets its name after Devon, England, which was the <clears throat> first place where strata from this per geologic period were uh, identified and defined. And likewise, uh, like every other geologic period, it has subdivisions like stages and things like that. And those are also mostly named after nearby towns and villages, which were close to where rocks from each of those respective subdivisions were found. <clears throat> and it's sometimes colloquially called the uh, Age of Fishes due to the fact that it had very diverse marine fauna, which dominated a significant portion of the macroscopic biosphere at the time. So, as with any geologic period, you have to define a boundary for it. You know, it's not just uh, some some gradient. Geologists like to be able to point somewhere with a number or a horizon and say, this is where period X starts and this is where it ends. And <clears throat> while a lot of these geologic periods both start and end with some sort of extinction event, the lower Silurian Devonian boundary actually isn't um, marked by any sort of mass extinction. It's just marked by a change in graptolite species. And over here on the side, we've got an example the, an example of what these things look like. It's little fossils. No death here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So again, no no major disruptive events in the in the biosphere occurred at this point in time at this boundary. However, 
the upper boundary of the Devonian, which divides the Devonian and the Carboniferous, is very clearly marked by a very large extinction event, which we're going to talk about oh, here a little bit. Can I ask a question? Uh, what are Coraptolites? I am not familiar with them. Uh, I'm not terribly um, familiar oh. with them either. Oh, they're uh, uh, they are relatives of um, of I think they're hemichordates, if I remember correctly. Hmm. I think yes, raptolites are in the hemichordate group. I think I believe they're in the hemichordate group. Not positive. Someone could certainly check that, but I think that's they're they're. Uh, that's my understanding they are, as well. Yeah, they're index. They're really Jackson good index about. fossils. But yeah, that's really all I know about them. Not not a whole lot. So. Yeah, they're very similar to things like um, microfossils in terms of being able to divide them based on species, uh, on tiny little changes in their morphology, due to the fact that those tiny changes are stratigraphically separated. So they're really good, uh, and they're also very widespread. So they're really good for defining specific narrow intervals. But aside from that, I don't know much about them. That's. Thanks. So thanks, Jackson. Um, so when you look at the paleogeography of the Devonian, you see a world that was very different from what we have right now. Um, as in most, as most of the past is. As most of the past is, yeah. But this is, um, you'll you'll see why in a moment. So during most of the Devonian period, North America, Greenland and Europe were in this single minor supercontinent known as uh, Laurasia or your America. And then you had up to the north, Siberia was kind of doing its own thing. Oh, is, is, then, is it pronounced Laurasia? This is, um, there'll be Laurentia. Laurasia is a different supercontinent that formed uh, a little bit later on, right? Yeah. Sorry, I got that messed up. Laurentia mm. is what I meant to type there. Sorry. Anyways, oh. um, but the union of this supercontinent took place in pretty early in the Devonian. Uh, right at the very start of the Devonian, it wasn't fully formed, but then it quickly came together. And so you started getting those mountain belts that cut right across it due to the tectonic uh, collisions. And then down in the south, you had South America, Africa, India, Australia, and Antarctica joined into Gondwana. Well, are there by any chance the Appalachian Mountains? Uh, yes. All right. I, I, I know my geology, yes. <laughs> yep. They're, those are very ancient mountains. That's why today they're so low. And also why they track right across into Europe. And that uh, right along the Rheic Ocean there is actually where uh, we think vascular, at this time, it was where we think vascular plants started to emerge. Really? Because I, yeah. I talk in, a, in a, a, sorry, I talk a bit later in this about the implications for the geology on yeah. the development of plants, but I had no idea that we had a specific idea of where that started. Yeah, there was uh, this response I was doing to a creation research institute or something uh little blog they did and they were talking about these this fossil find down there where these basically they would have been towering giants of, of the plant world at the time but they were about ankle high uh starting to have some vascular structure to them uh, really really well, interesting stuff it, it, it makes sense because uh, at that place it will be the equator right or close to the equator yeah it's not terribly far off from the equator so I, I know. It's, it's, do we know uh, on this on this map? Do we know this is where the where the continents were right now? Is that is this where we are now, or where Asia is, or Europe is right now on the map? Or where this all that kinds are, are floating around. Um, I believe that the line running down the center is still the prime meridian. Okay. Which is which runs through the UK. So if you can visualize them, the Mercurator projection, this is that that should be uh, okay. An analogous with this map. So so basically, nothing's happening on the, the Earth right now. It's all all watery goodness. Yeah, basically. So the Devonian was known for having very diverse depositional environments. This was actually where you start to see geologic depositional environments get a lot more varied 
um, uh, in part owing to the development of plants, which I'll talk about in a bit. But through what we call Facey's reconstructions, our, our general interpretation of the Devonian was that it was pretty warm, wet, and it was a diverse world, but it was also pretty stable. Uh, aside from a period of great tectonic activity, as your America and Gondwana drew closer together, which would later in geologic history eventually form Pangaea. Um, built, uh, again, those collisions were building up those mountains. But aside from that, it wasn't, you know, a terribly unstable world. Uh, there was, oh, there's a typo. Uh, there was little polar ice. Uh, but we do have in some locations that have been preserved, known from high paleo latitudes, limited glacial sediments. So you can see like tills and glacial marine sediments, but they're not very extensive. So there's a little bit of ice. We know that but not like the polar ice caps today, and certainly not like some of the ice ages Earth has experienced in its past. And here's the general look of what the land would have looked like. You can see you've got those, those towering giant plants that maybe come up to your ankle around little pools. The land was still very barren and sort of dry. I don't know if Jackson's talking about this, but will this be the... I've heard, I've heard I've heard about this before. We talked we talked about this earlier. Is this the era of the giant fung funguses? In part, I mean, Prototaxites I think started in the Silurian, but like straggled into the Devonian. But they got yeah, replaced. The, early, the, the, the vascular early plants early. took over. Yeah. Yes, yeah, they, they, yeah, they got replaced as the vascular plants took over. So, right. so. Also during the Devonian, you had uh, oceans covering about 85% of the planet. And you also had these large epicontinental seas, which you can see in this diagram here, are basically covering the fringes of Gondwana. And then you've also got one that basically cut right up into your America. Um, this is where most of our Devonian marine deposits came from. Uh, you also had the Paleo Tethys Sea, which would later become very important for oil. And... Uh, in the intercontinents, you had a lot of growing arid space, which would lead to the uh, would lead to a large collection of aeolian deposits across these continental interiors. Although it wasn't like exclusively arid, you had a lot more going on, but deserts were pretty common. As an example of this, this is the old red sandstone in Scotland. And it's one of the most famous Devonian st uh, sediments in the world. And what it represents is a progressively drying environment throughout a large portion of the Devonian. When you start down at the base of the old red sandstone, which isn't actually like down here in this picture because it's much thicker than this. But when you start at the very base of that unit, you see braided river sediments. And then as you go up, the river sediments start to intermix with lake sediments, but then those lakes start to get smaller and the river sediments start to become more sparse and you start seeing dunes appear with these wetter sediments and then the dunes towards the top eventually become predominant. And the old red sandstone represents this kind of a progressively drying river to arid sedimentary system and it spans all the way through Great Britain and Ireland and uh, Scotland. And then it comes all the way into North America because, it, again, at the time, all of that was connected. But one of the biggest changes to terrestrial sedimentation was actually the establishment of plants on the land. And this is partially because as plants begin to develop uh, in the Devonian, they start getting roots and roots stabilize uh, terrestrial sediments in particular in non-arid non-arid environments so prior to the development of roots rivers were mostly depositing sediment in sheet-like braided patterns however as roots in plants began to develop and floodplains became more established with these plants the interactions of those roots with the sediments caused rivers to slow 
And so the rivers began to meander, similar to what you see on modern floodplains, with those slow, coiling, snake-like patterns. And they would uh, slowly meander left and right across wider areas, and they would deposit wider sediments, but they were much more varied in texture and structure. You would start seeing the appearance of many more cut and fill structures, for example, or abandoned channels. And it led to our rivers in particular being very uh, different from what you see prior to the development of plants. And this actually, this pattern continues, especially up into the Carboniferous is where we see the most meandering rivers. And then this actually, just fun fact, this tracks throughout geologic time. Like when you have the, the Permian Triassic extinction, meandering river sediments are almost entirely gone. You start so, seeing those braided patterns again because plants were killed off. For so what's what, so what is meandering river? That the thing that goes side to side thing? You know, you know the Mississippi River, how it's got that coiling. I should have had yeah. a picture in here. That coiling snake like, like snake. pattern. Yeah. yeah, that's a meandering river. Whereas a braided river has like little tiny curves in it, but it mostly just branches off and together and flows in a straight line. Without the plant roots, the river can't flow enough to develop those, you know, meandering patterns. That's why you see braided rivers primarily in deserts. So this was just an image I found. Of. Uh, and that's uh, the late uh, Devonian. Yeah, this was late Devonian, but this was what river sediments started. Or river. Lycopods. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's weird. That you see a very, very small plant. That, Still rocks in the early Devonian period. The first picture. Now it's all more, more mm -hmm. lush now. They still had a lot of sh really shallow roots by comparison to modern plants, though. Yeah, and that's they, why they, when that you get the into like that, be alien, I remember like an alien root, like we have giant horse tails and giant club mosses. Like it would be very weird to be around that. So pretty cool. But plants also had a particularly interesting uh, effect on geology, aside from the rivers. And that was due to how they affect soil development. So during the Devonian, as plant cover starts to become more and more widespread, you start seeing a lot more fossil soils. And it's it's debated as to whether or not they made soils more common or if they just made them easier to identify and preserve. Um, because fossil soil horizons, paleosols, are our remnants of ancient soils. And of course, plant matter allows soils to become more stable to change in climate conditions, also introduces a lot of uh, acids and other things as they decay and allows them to become more mature and more organic, rich. also allows for the preservations of, of rootlets and other things, which are one of the uh, characteristic identifiers of a fossil soil horizon. If you see all these in-place rootlets at a particular level, that probably indicates that was a, a soil surface at some time. And prior to the presence of plants, paleosols that we do have, because you do see some, they're generally not that thick and they're not that well developed in terms of looking mature, quote unquote. They don't have, and they usually don't have what's called an A or O horizon, which is essentially the very upper layer of a soil, of a well organized soil that is usually full of organic matter. Yeah, that's so you have, to, you have to have the mulch. The mulch for that exactly yeah uh, i have a i have a question yeah um it's related to this what does what does shirt mean c-h-e-r-t what what type of deposit is that shirt yeah uh shirt is mostly a silicate sort of thing that tends to marine then yeah it's marine it comes from like silicate oozes or also um there's another, there's another, it's actually, it's funny you mention that because it's one of the things that geologists still aren't terribly sure of because we don't see it developing in any modern environment right now. Um, yeah. The other hypothesis is that it, because it's primarily found in limestone is that it might be the result of silicate in limey sediments uh, being transported through groundwater into certain horizons and then just like accumulating there into big layers of that tough silicate material. Nobody's really sure. Uh, there's uh, some. It seems like they they probably forms both ways at least. There's is it maybe more? So for like a lay person, it looks like sandstone, though, right? Like to me, if I saw a piece of it, I'd think it was. Yeah, or um, uh, the the common term for shirt is flint. Uh, is what? Uh, flint. 
You know the stuff you use to make arrowheads? That's usually shirt. Oh. And yeah. was this is this is where the was this where the flint flint comes from this time period? Oh no, it's found it's found everywhere. Okay. Yeah, you uh, find, uh, anywhere you've got silicates, you have and limestones, you have shirt horizons. Now I also know this is your your expertise too. I think me and Jackson mentioned this once before, uh, uh, earlier one, and I don't know if I, I forget if I heard this on the Eon channel or the Shy Show channel, mm -hmm. but uh, didn't. Uh, didn't like fungus had to come on on land before the plants did to make room for the plants. They, they had to break down the rock to make soil for the plants. Um, it's more like I mean, not no. It's it's more like the uh, fungi were providing. Um, they were taking nutrients from the sediment, but they weren't really breaking it down. The plant okay. or plants, the most basally derived plants, the bryophytes, uh, anther anthocerophytes, and hepatophytes have rhizoids. So okay. they don't dig very deep in the sediment anyway. But uh, fungi were there first. Yeah, you had cyanobacteria. And so uh, some cyanobacteria will f and some algae will form um, lichen associations what? with uh, certain fungi. And then from there, it was just kind of a short hop to the the rhizoid association with plants. Uh, fungal I, rhizoid I, would, I, would guess that, I would guess there was a near something is... Uh colonization between the, the the algae early plants and fungi uh because of there was a, a, a close a, 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 consor a consorted uh or at the same time like they were I, I, I was wondering I, I doubt all the soils here to sure. begin with there's no when they plants first came here there the, i doubt there's a whole bunch of bunch of soil already waiting way for them well i mean there's it in a sense like I guess I don't know, Colton. How do you like define soil? How do you, how is that defined? So, soil, as I understand it, is typically defined as the upper layer of uh, a chemically dissolving surface or chemically uh, changing surface that is divided into very discrete horizons. Usually, it's like a in order. I believe it goes O A B. C, E, and F, I'm pretty sure is the order. And in any given location, you may have some of those missing, but where they are found, they will be in a specific order. But so, okay, so really, so to answer Lamont's question, there was soil, not as, not the same sort of soil that we would recognize now, probably, but there no, was soil. No, it would most, it would look more like, um, in deserts where you don't have a lot of these plant interactions or the organics, right. you'll get these um, very thin, uh, chalky almost, or sandy but soils, still... quote unquote. Right. But they are soils. Okay. They're just sure. not okay. very mature. Right. I gotcha. Okay. So it can only like hold like certain, like more, like more primitive, I think like primitive, but like more basic types of plants, nothing like lush. Yes, exactly. And then when you get into the Precambrian is where soils get weird because the atmosphere was for a lot of that time different uh, than what pre, we have now. Say, say Precambrian, or you mean the Precarboniferous? No, Precambrian. Oh, pre okay, okay, I'm like, okay. Yeah. I thought we were going to order here. Like, even, like, even when, you, like, even if you look at soils from just terrestrial Cambrian deposits versus older Precambrian ones, there's a distinct difference. So, like the Ediacaran yep. time? Yep. Yeah, you know, I, I still. Uh, the, that's, that's, uh, that's still I think it has to do. With, I think it has to do with the oxygen content of the atmosphere exactly. because it oxidizes yep. the soil. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Poor, poor Ediacaran. It's it's stuck in the Precambrian. There's no. There's no pre. Instead of having the pre Ediacaran period, it's the pre. The pre yeah, I know. It's, it's actually what I was. What I also talked about with the photosynthesis uh, uh, stream, where I discussed how oxygen impacted the geology of the Earth too. So it's really interesting. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the oxygen was important for things like banded iron formations and other, all those other weird, funky deposits that we don't have today either. And early insect development, because uh, you had the little springtail right. guys that were able to uh, really get a good foothold because the oxygen levels in the uh, in the soil, same as the as the plants. So, now for the fun but somewhat sad part of the Devonian period. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the Devonian period's upper boundary is marked by a very noticeable, distinct extinction event. 
uh, technically, we, we call it the late Devonian extinction, and technically it's not one event. It actually was like three pulses uh, where you had one at the uh, Gvechian Frasian boundary, then the the Fra uh, Frasian uh, Famnian boundary, and then the Devonian Carboniferous was like the last one, and that last pulse is just where we draw the line. Uh. Uh, forgive my butchering of those names, <laughs> by the way. Quick question, real fast. Mm -hmm. Do you? I, I forget. Not it, was this like the smallest of the mass extinctions? I recall correct. If I recall correctly, yes. Uh, it, but it was still pretty, pretty bad. At a small, the smallest of the big five is still big. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, and in, in relation to that, it seems to have resulted in 19% of all families and 50% of all genera at that time just going extinct. Bye-bye. Good night forever. And, and once again, somehow, we are we survived. Yep. All right. I, know, so I think a, a, another reason why it's the, it was the smallest of the big five is because the there wasn't a lot of life on that had developed on land yet. It was like still in its infancy when it got you know kicked while <laughs> while it was down yeah that that is actually a good point um now one of the things we note with the late devonian extinction is the chemical traces that we find in those shallow marine sediments indicate there was a massive depletion in oxygen called anoxia and this led to the burial of a very large amount of organic matter that otherwise would have decayed as a result the a very upper Devonian, particularly in the United States, is a massive oil reservoir. You find tons of oil deposits around there. And so it's important for us to, to set our sights on that during oil exploration. Um, and say goodbye to our poor, our poor little buddies here, just choking out in the oceans because they've got no oxygen left. Right. As for the potential causes of this, um, while we do have the widespread anoxia, we don't know what caused that. We don't really have an idea. And we're not even sure if it's responsible for the dying off or was also a result of something else that caused the killing first, or at least in tandem. So while there were there are plenty of proposals that have been given uh, for what caused the late Devonian extinction, we don't have a solid answer. And all the potential ones are speculative or based on inconclusive evidence. Some have proposed a meteor strike was the cause. And while we do have a lot of Devonian craters, none currently known indicate a big enough strike to cause such an extinction event, nor, I didn't, I didn't add this, but it, it was something I found during later reading today, uh, nor is there any evidence of, like, say, a series of smaller strikes hitting at the same time. We don't uh, so, have any evidence of that either. So nothing like the K KPG? Thing. No, not anywhere close. These were, uh, as far as I understand, the most of the Devonian craters we have indicate strikes like, um, oh god, I don't remember how to pronounce it, but the one thing that happened in Siberia, the one that like blasted an entire forest dead, but did, like that was the most... Was that like that? Event. Yeah, uh, that one. Yeah, I can't, well, I feel like I can pronounce it. <laughs> Also, like, yeah. like the, the main cause of the extinction was, as you said, uh, low oxygen. But I, I don't remember if with the KPG extinction event, though, was there also an impact of low oxygen? There was. You do, you do see oh, that. Right. Um, right. You see, you well, see was, the anoxia. Yeah, the Deccan traps, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Those two. Yeah, I, I forget where, what. I think one. Of the, I know it's still a hypothesis or theory. I think at one time someone, someone thought like. A, a, like a bunch of soil, soil and stuff got in the oceans, and that fed fed plant, fed the ocean. Plants. Oh, we're gonna talk about that, Lamont. <laughs> Jumping ahead, that's what I did. Uh, and Jackson, thank you for bringing up the uh, the Deccan traps, because another hypothesis for the late Devonian extinction is maybe mass volcanism had something to do with it. And there is some support for this, uh, along with the anoxia in the very late Devonian rocks correlating to those pulses. You see spikes in mercury levels. 
factors. And mercury is a common byproduct of massive volcanic eruptions. But again, I thought I probably, it probably wasn't as bad as the Deccan traps of the late, late Permian. <laughs> no, no, not as bad. Uh, however, one of the contradictory things about this hypothesis is that we don't have sufficiently large volcanic rocks of the correct age known from the Devonian. You... You know, when you think of like the uh, the the Permian Triassic extinction, which was caused by I think the Deccan traps, maybe it was the Siberian ones, I don't remember. Um, those you have the rocks; they're there and they're massive. They're, they cover a wide, wide area, and volcanic rocks are usually pretty durable. So while it's it could be possible that they were all eroded away since the Devonian, it. Mm, it's one of those things where it seems to be a sign pointing away from volcanism being the cause, even though you, it doesn't exclusively rule it out, I guess. But uh, later, and this is a very recent development, and I learned this from Erica, uh, from, you know, Gutsick Gibbon. Uh, if anyone wants to watch her excellent video on this, you, you know, there's the link. If anyone wants to you know, type that into their address bar. She goes over another hypothesis that was recently developed. Namely, that the extinction may have been caused by the development of root systems on land, with land plants. Because as roots developed, perhaps it was the case that this allowed them to stir up the ground and dump nutrients into, into the rivers, which carried it into Earth's oceans. And what lives in the oceans? A lot of algae. And perhaps they, these algae caused massive blooms which choked the oceans of oxygen and caused the anoxia that we see so maybe that had something to do with it along with i don't know maybe smaller volcanism or something like, like I said, that maybe, like maybe it wasn't this one thing maybe it was like a chain reaction of things. oh it could absolutely it could have been and she actually covers that in her video um another thing she covers is that we do have evidence of starting to get the developments of ice becoming more common, which would have made the epicontinental seas shallower, and that would have killed some stuff. So it seems like there may have just been a lot going on that made it made it a really bad it's, day for the Earth. It's it's like too much, too much, yeah, more water, less water. Too much water, uh, the stuff on land starts drowning. Too less water, the stuff in the ocean starts to... Suffocate, yeah. Um, do, and while you also see out, some, like, a drop in temperature? There was also the a drop in temperature yep. in the late Devonian. All right. Yep. Yep. Leading into that carboniferous ice age. Um, and while the blooms that you know were brought up in this hypothesis may not have been the sole cause, what they certainly explain is the anoxia we see, and also the presence of widespread oil deposits. Because not only does the anoxia preserve, you know, a lot of organic matter, but the algae themselves would provide a ton of organic matter to eventually settle to the bottom and turn into oil. Yeah. And that also explains the, the, the drop in temperature. You have the CO2 sequestration. It is. Mm -hmm. right. Yep. Which leads to your, you know, your runaway cooling effects. And that explains why you have that early carboniferous ice age that happened. All right. And that's it. That's all, all I right. got. All right. Got to ask this question for for our good old YEC fans out there. Ugh. Is this pre or post flood? <laughs> oh. Okay, that's really yeah. funny you ask that. No. Because <laughs> um, there's like a growing little bit of their whole little geology community who's starting to consider that like, okay, right at the Carboniferous is where Noah's flood stopped. Like, just everything below the Carboniferous is fine to still say Noah's Flood did it, but then everything beyond that is, like, a recolonization of the land. It's really weird, and it's not widely accepted by a lot of their their side of things. But it's funny that I think I, I see it gaining a bit more of a foothold in their in their uh, literature. Uh, well, what do they specifically point to that says, like, oh, this is where the flood uh, uh, Well, part of why they're doing it is because you see, like, in the Carboniferous in particular, you start seeing tidal cycles show up a lot in like well-preserved well tidal cycles. And when you have a sequence of tidal cycles that shows monthly, you know, orbits of the moon 
mm-hmm. for periods of upwards of 20 plus years consecutively building up a 20 year record of daily four times a day laminations in a, in a, you know, a several tens of meters thick sequence of rock. That's, that's 20 years of rock right there. That can't be from a single year. And the, and they even note in their damn journal, one of their damn journal articles that we can't say these aren't tidal laminations because they show a lunar crossover. So we can't just say it was the damn flume experiments. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so they're like, we don't know what to do with this. Uh, I guess it may have just started or ended here. So, I don't know. I just think that's funny. <laughs> but that's all I got for the geology. Awesome. Everyone out there there in YouTube land, give a round of applause to Mr. Bulford. Thank you. All I'm right. sorry no if anyone objection. can hear my cat screaming. No, uh, oh, it's fine. <laughs> Uh, and now we're going to talk about Action. things living on the land or on the land above the water, in the water above the land. <laughs> Mr. Tricking Walter in the background. <laughs> yes. I don't know what it is. It's, <laughs> it's Darwin's tank. Oh, yeah, that's Darwin's tank back there. His is always bubbling. I actually had to get him a new filter because I don't, I don't know what the hay happened with the last one. Wait, so do I have to screen share? If you can. Okay, that's fine. That's fine. It's no, fine, Jackson. Nobody wants to see anything you have to present. Fine, <laughs> I'll just leave then. God. Alrighty. Um, can we see my presentation? Yes. 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 Okay. Well, since Colton already gave the game away about the extinction, that was going to be my first thing. Spoilers. Okay. I know. Spoiler alert. God. All right. Ugh. The Devonian. It's what we've been talking about this whole night. Um, so one of the major transitions, which we'll get into later, is uh, the transition from lobe-finned fish, the earlier Sarcopterygians, um, as they made their transition into the tetrapods. Vascular plants evolved lignified tissue, which led to the uh, origin of trees and tree-like plants. And then, which, as you got the wood. Just described, yep, we got wood, we got deeper roots, this um, leach nutrients from the soil, causing eutrophication, global cooling, all that good stuff. Death to the land organ, death to the land and the aquatic organisms. So, anyway, we so, all got that already. Yeah, so, real fast. Uh, we know in the Carboniferous, there is no reason for plants to, um, plants survive after they die because nothing can could break them down yet. That probably was that the same in the Devonian plants too. Well, yeah. They're, well, I mean, you can break down plants. You can you can break down cellulose. You just can't break down lignin at that point. Yeah. Lignin okay. was the thing that wasn't degrading because it's a long, complicated molecule, and so you had you basically had to wait until the uh, the agaricomycetes uh, got the ability to uh, to break down lignin in the yeah in the right. Carboniferous. But so, it's yeah. also important to note that even though the lignin appeared, uh, I think it was like around the middle of the Devonian. It wasn't very common until the Carboniferous, of course. Then that's when right. the big carbon deposits happened because of the prevalence of uh, wood. Right, yeah. right, yeah, exactly. Right. So, okay, uh, Devonian rhineophyte. So, of course, we're going to talk about plants now. Rhineophyte is a paraphyletic term. Oh, did you change uh, slide? Oh, I'm sorry. Whoops. I forgot. I got to go out and then go back again. My bad. Okay. Do we see mm-hmm. the new slide now? Yes. Correct. Okay. All right. Awesome. Okay. So rhineophyte, um, that's just a paraphyletic grouping of different um, early um, vascular plants uh, like Agliophyton and Zostrophyllum. Um, they're fairly similar in their overall morphology. They're both very early vascular plants, but rhineophyte just encompasses a, real, a whole bunch of the early Silurian and Devonian yeah. plants. Um, so as you can see, these guys do not have lignin. They're little, as Colton was talking about, where these guys are like, you know, ankle tall, little bitty. Um, so what's cool, about what, what's cool about these is harken back, if you will, dear viewers, uh, to our chat that we had on the evolution of plants. Mm-hmm. If you remember fondly from that chat, um, the earliest, or sorry, the most basally derived plants, much like the 
um, the algae that we have today, or most the green algae, we'll say, um, their life their life cycle is haploid dominant. So most of their life cycle is spent in the haploid phase. They only have one, uh, you know, half their set of chromosomes. They only have the diploid phase for well, the green algae only have their hop, their diploid phase very shortly when they're a zygote, then they immediately do meiosis and revert back to haploid. When you get to the earliest plant, the earliest embryophytes, the quote land plants like the mosses and hornworts and liverworts, they are they are slightly starting to move the dial back. They're allowing their diploid life cycle, which is called their sporophyte phase to go on a little bit longer. They're doing mitosis in their diploid phase, but they're doing most of their mitosis in their gametophyte phase, which is the haploid phase. So just think, for most of their life, they're haploid like algae rather than diploid like the later more derived plants. Yeah. And so here, I hope that made sense. Clear as mud, right? Uh, <laughs> um, yep. So here we have... A picture of the life cycle of Agliophyton. So you have um, the gametes. So you have the little picture on the far on, on the left side of this little diagram. You got all the, the the male and female gametes. Then they form. Hold on. Yeah. Then they're forming their um, their their sporophyte. Uh, sporophyte. Yeah. And then, yeah. And then you're forming your spores. And then you are. Uh, forming your uh gametophyte these get for, or uh these meet and then you get your gametophyte phase then your gametophyte is doing most of the growing that's this green portion the green on these guys is their gametophyte that's the diploid part then the orange part is the sorry is our haploid part and the orange little parts up here on the both the agliophyte and the zostrophil and those are the diploid sporophytes so the sporophyte just a little bit on the much larger, comparatively speaking, gametophyte. So, okay, okay. Sorry if I made that complicated. I apologize. I'm just does, it, does I'm that just... make does that make sense? Like it's yeah, yeah. it's I'll... try. They're moving towards more complex plants, but they're still doing a lot of stuff like earlier algae. Is the best way I can yeah. put it. I, I also get to the sporophyte and gametophyte confused. <laughs> it's, it's a... Yeah, sporophyte is diploid and gametophyte is haploid. And the whole process is complicated. So, <laughs> okay. Uh, Manila phyta appears in the Devonian. Manila phyta are the ferns and the horsetails. And ferns, of course, as we know, are very common throughout um, the rest of the Paleozoic and into the Mesozoic. And then the angiosperms kind of take over and push everybody else out because angiosperms mm -hmm. are prolific, yeah, incredibly prolific. Them. Before them, the, yeah. the Manila fights uh, seized the means of production. <laughs> they did exactly right, and the Manila fights are the last to produce to reproduce uh, via spores. So the green you see here on so the fern, you can't see the gametophyte. This is all the sporophyte. The sporophyte is much larger. We are moving more. Toward, we have moved past uh, sort of the halfway point for plants. Are spending more than half of their life as this big gametophyte sorry is this big sporophyte good lord um, <laughs> exactly. and they're producing yeah. spores and then the spores um yeah form your your they fall down form your gametophyte your gametophyte makes gametes and then your spore your big sporophyte grows out of that oh well i don't know why i explained it because i have a chart here which oh, yeah. does right. it much okay. better so here you go here's a chart <laughs> Make it much easier to understand. So yeah, what you were seeing was... Yeah, oh, sorry, the little heart, the okay. little heart shape uh, uh, thing on the top right, that is the gametophyte. Yes. Side. Yep, that's the part that's down there in the soil. You couldn't see that. Then it makes the gametes. The gametes form the, the, the zygote. And then that forms the sporophyte, which grows out. And that those big fronds that you see, that's the sporophyte. That's the diploid portion. Yeah. And part it, of the reason... Oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, yeah, I was just uh, to point out that the, uh, the gametophyte, like, it, even though it's, uh, it's drawn very large, it's actually very tiny. Sometimes it's, it's, it's just one cell thick. Sometimes. Right. But, yeah. Right, yeah. Um, but the, the thinking is, 
for plants, and we were actually discussing this just the other day, um, was for plants, as they shifted more to the land, they became more and more uh, diploid. Because the green al- most green algae are aquatic, either freshwater or saltwater, and they spend almost their entire life as haploid, because they don't need to be complex. You just throw your gametes and your spores into the water and, you know, off you go. But when you're on land, it's harder. You have to wait longer for either wind or rain or, you know, an animal to come by and transport either your spores or your gametes. So, so you're so, you're dependent so, on the kindness of others. <laughs> so are spores more like seeds or are the spores more like the po- the pollen? Uh, so the, the pollen is, are the gametes. So pollen is the male gamete. Okay. Oh, the, the pollen is actually the gametophyte, even though it's fa- uh, fairly yes. reduced in, yeah, in uh, angiosperms. Yeah, yeah. With yeah, by the time you get to angiosperms, well, and and gymnosperms, your your gametophyte phase is super reduced. They're almost yeah. entirely um, sporophyte, almost yeah, it's, entirely. It, yeah, it's it's, it's just, like the, the gametophyte is only a few cells. Right. Uh, yeah. So were yeah. The pl- were the plants here more wind based, or was there any animals at this time carrying? Transports? Oh, I mean, there were there were beetles around, or like stem beetles. Um, there were stem beetles. Uh, in the Devonian. In the Devonian, yeah, there were. Um, there were I don't think so. No, I, I, I don't think, think so. They were. Weren't there? There were, no. there were like uh, sp- the springtail like like organisms. I don't know. I, I could okay. be wrong. I don't, I, I, I'm not, I wouldn't aware. I, 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 some, I, I, some basal, I, I, I basal beetles, well, insects. Yeah. We had some basal yeah. insects in the Devonian and you would have had rain and, but probably nothing also. like our, our, our common, our, our after, after our, the, the, uh, Cretaceous bees and insects carrying around pollen flowers. No, stuff. I don't think so. There were some, so there were a couple, um, uh, symbioses in the Jurassic with um, you're gonna have to help me out, Brain Bug. Uh, the group What's... that had a symbiosis with the Benetitales. What were those? Um, it was a flying insect. I, Dang. Yeah, it, it, it's that's totally <sighs> eluding me. Uh, I can't remember. At any rate, there were a couple of them, but they weren't common. We there talked were very about few it. We talked about them uh, on one of the earlier earlier streams. So go back to the one. Uh, what was it? The one about fungus. I think we got into it, talking about. Uh, Maybe yeah, yeah, that may have been that one. There were. I, yeah, I'm sorry, I can't remember off the top of my head. But yeah, there were a couple, but not very many. It wasn't until yeah, you get to the Cretaceous that you get the the bee and wasp symbioses, and then it's, it really takes off for the flowers. Yeah, I also, I also look it up. The, the earliest fossil beetles are found in the uh, early. Well, uh, maybe, 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 in the lower Permian period. So probably okay. evolved. Ah, gotcha. But they probably evolved in the Carboniferous. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So already. Still All right. So then. let's. Yeah. So we're we're dealing with very early insects in the Devonian. Yeah. Mo- most of the the familiar groups are not here yet. All right. So let's shift gears from plants because we've made this complicated enough. I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about trilobites. Yay! Mocoplex. I know this is. I'm sorry. This is the only. Um, <laughs> this is the only arthropod uh, slide I have. So the cool thing is in the Cambrian, that's where you get your sort of stereotypical trilobites. Trilobites did not evolve uh, ball rolling behaviors or spines, shovels, any of that kind of stuff until later in the. Um, uh, Crap. The the Great Ordovician oh. Biodiversification oh. event. That's when. Can I ask you a question, Jackson? You just did, Colton. Well, okay. Um, <laughs> so I assume we know about the ball rolling behavior because we found fossils of them stuck in that yes. position. Yes. That's cool. It is cool. I actually have uh, like one or two of them, but yeah, you can look it up online. Um, they do they roll, 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 roll themselves roly. into a little ball. Like yeah, like a little roly poly. It's pretty cool. Yeah. Anybody remember the time Kent Hoven used that as a reason why he thought that uh isopods <laughs> were living trilobites? I was amazing. just I was just thinking about that when I said the holy poly. Yeah, they were just they were just they were the roly polies that could live that lived 900 years, like the, the, like everyone could pre-flood, like like how chameleons became triceratops because they, they grew bigger. Right. Yep. That's just amazing. Personally, Wallaceops is my favorite. 
That's just like that proboscis is on point. What is even going on there? I love that, it. I love it so much. Is that um, calcified? He, he, I want one. I, I, I think he's trying to uh, uh, cosplay as, as Poseidon. Can you yes. Because see? of the, tri the, I, of the I, Triton. I, <laughs> I don't know if it's... If it's uh, I mean, I, I assume the whole thing is just fossilized. I don't know what spe or how specifically it's what mineral mm. is involved in mm. there. I'm sorry. Oh, well, Look, Colton's a geology guy here. I'm just a biology guy. I don't. Well, I was thinking. Well, I don't know oh, you mean how they fossilized? Oh, oh, I like should that, think, like Oh no, I think it's just the bit. exoskeleton. I think it's just like just an extension of the exoskeleton. So was well, like they, they, so the all it is. trilobites. Uh, one of the one of the unique things about them was that there was the the calcium level in in, in their exoskeletons uh, was really really high. They had soft parts as well, but I'm, I'm wondering yeah. if that probiotic it's, was... it's also interesting that, that like many of most of the fossils of trilobites are just there, uh, like uh, molted exoskeletons because they are really, yeah, really tough. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it's also, if you, exactly. if you look at the if you also look at these examples, many, many spines. Hmm, I wonder why. <laughs> many yep, spines. Yeah, some some sort of um, the predators going around there, yeah. or it could you know, be all sexual display. Who knows, right? <laughs> I wonder. If, I wonder if any of those those spines are venomous, though. I wonder if they've done any. Uh, so, what was eating trilobites at this be time? Because this is after mm -hmm. the the giant shrimp of the monster, the Carboniferous, uh, the I mean, the Cambrian. So, what was eating these things? These are probably still at the bottom of the food chain, I'm guessing. Oh, I mean, at this point, you've got fish <laughs> swimming around, yeah. like jawed fish. So, And, and you yeah. still have uh, uh, giant scorpions in the in the, in the the sea. Not, I'm not talking yeah. about sea scorpions that aren't actual You're scorpions, the but real scorpions. Oh, oh, yeah, like actual, like... Um, a bunch of scorpio. Uh, yeah. A bunch of scorpio. The big yeah. one, yeah. The the big freaking scorpion. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Big these guys are getting scorpion. eaten by a lot of things at this point, probably. <laughs> but they're still, but they're still awesome. Try to buy. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yep. And they held cool. on long after the Devonian. So. They did. Yeah. This is just these guys are all Devonian. I just happened to pick a couple Devonian ones. Yeah. So. Yeah. They're just pretty cool. All right, so let's move on to the uh, the vertebrates, more specifically the uh, the the nathostomes, because there are still there are still um, placoderms around at this time, and and even um, jawless placoderms. Uh, but we get our, we get our early sharks in this time period, like Xenocanthus up there on the top right, which don't really look like sharks, at least not like modern sharks. They look you know, kind of more eel-like. They're pretty strange. Um, then Stethacanthus down there in the bottom right. A lot of people call this a shark, but it's not. Holocephalans are the uh, the ratfish or chimeras. Uh, mm. Helicoprion is also a member of this group. They're not yeah. sharks. The, they are related uh, to sharks. Do what? Okay, so go ahead. So go ahead. Like, uh, I was like the, the, the uh, how do you call it again? The uh, spiral food. Sure, yeah. yeah. So what makes them... What makes them what makes them chimeras? I mean, I'm not. I don't know what their exact what the, the definition the is, morphology yeah. is. Yeah, with the definition, the morphological definition of a of a yeah. chimera is. But I, I'm just saying that that's what okay. group they fall under. So if you go look at like Wikipedia oh, okay. or whatever, I they thought, can tell you. I, okay, I thought that the, the, I thought it'd be like like how how some people back in the day like did like platypuses, like like chimera of different body parts. That, Oh no no! No, it's, they're it's, not. It's, they're it's not. Just, it's just the name of Dexom. It's the name of yeah. Dexom. Oh, oh, yeah. okay, okay. I was like, oh, it has a duck bill for platypus, and all this, a tail of a beaver, and all this stuff. Out. No, like... yeah, no. Uh, Holocephala <laughs> okay. is is the group uh, of the ratfish or chimeras. Uh, That's their uh, name. Oh, okay, okay. I think you. I think so, it was like actually commit, but like different body parts, different different things. I have yeah. a question about Xenocanthus. Was it because it kind of looks like a frilled shark to me? Uh, I have no idea. That's a good question. Yeah, there were a lot of really weird sharks in this time period. Mm. Like uh, Orthocanthus yeah. is another weird eel-like one. And it's, 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 sharks are another group who are often uh, uh, called the living fossils. Like uh, uh, we know uh, crocodiles. It's very, it's very 
<laughs> very sh sh uh, shame, shameful to call them living fossils right. because they have a yeah very oh yeah I mean, like system. The, but, yeah exactly the modern looking sharks didn't come along to like the, i think the jurassic or cretaceous so yeah all right that's very but, recent but, like mammals mammals evolved by the time also so it's mm -hmm. it's really unfair to say that sharks are different fossils as well. okay question right. for you on the left side all those fish and stuff and that were they all were they really around at the same time like this like, like, they've been around the, at the exact the, same time no or they um, more spread out the, the devonian yeah they were more spread out like so that was the thing about um that was what made the uh, the poland the poland tetrapod track so weird was like eustenopteron precedes tiktaalik in the fossil record and then both of those precede ichthyostega and acanthostega and so then when the poland tracks were found it was really weird because like there was this really nice nice sequence and it's like, oh, they're all just kind of um, conveniently or, uh, oriented um, uh, late surviving members of these lineages rather than actually being representative of the guys who were around at that particular time. I, so, I, would, I, would also, I would also guess it's maybe an, uh, like an artifact of like looking for uh, a specific site. Like, for example, oh, we have this older fossil and this later right. also let's look for something in between chronologically speaking and they found something in between chronologically also so yeah right Probably yeah and good. now that yeah and now that they know to look earlier in time they've actually found earlier tetrapodomorphs like parmastega which was right. discovered i think last year so, so yeah so you mean that did this prove evolu evolution no far from it sorry long story short but you're wrong, <laughs> as always um <laughs> anyway uh then Wrong story, wrong. Wrong story, wrong, yeah. <laughs> um, I was reflect. I'm sorry, just pause for a second here. I was reflecting on our conversation with him and just, like, how abysmally bad it always was. Like, the platypus was a chimera and disproves common ancestry. Uh, I don't understand why Why are monkeys still here is, is a bad question. Just, just so much stuff. Oh, good lord. <laughs> like, just so much stuff. Anyway, they really ask this. why there's still monkeys. Yeah, that was like, okay, well, okay. So his argument was like he he was like, oh, why does in why does Pacasitas precede Indohias if Indohias is more basal? Um, and we were like, that's the why are there still monkeys question. He said, I don't understand why that's a problem. Like, are you serious? Are you kidding? <laughs> yeah, no, sorry. Anyways, back to the Devonian. <laughs> Moving on. Um, you got a couple of of a uh, little jawless placoderms here, like uh, Drepanaspis, that little flat guy down on the bottom left corner. And I think that's Paturiaspis, this guy who looks like an arrow down here by Dunkleosteus. So these are the, these are a couple different um, aquatic and, and semi-aquatic fauna, uh, vertebrate fauna. So lungs, let's talk about lungs. Has anybody here read Neil Shubin's newest, or other than me, who's read Neil Shubin's newest book, um, Some Assembly Required? Uh, Jackson, I, I can't read. I have not mm. yet, but now that I know it exists, I'll check it out. Yeah, I highly recommend. Not. It's a very good book. This is one of the things, and Colton, that's a, that was an impressive memorization thing you did there at the beginning then. I oh, guess. of course. <laughs> so, you just memorized everything. Amazing. Um, so one of the things he talks about in the book is the origin of lungs. So lungs did not evolve originally for breathing on land it evolved in fish who were in fresh water probably who are using them for gulping air when the water in or sorry when the oxygen in the water was low and fish right. today a lot of fish today still do that um uh bichers and uh, rope fish still do that paddle fish still do that sturgeons guards bowfin um and then a couple of other groups of teleosts have also evolved their own independent sort of lung system which is unrelated to the lung but function similarly, like the labyrinth in um, in betas and garamis. You know, it's um, fun. it's funny, yo. I always uh, I always thought that they're, they're the other way around, not the way. That, I always thought the swim bladder came first, and then what? And it became the lung, not the lung became the swim bladder. Yeah, yeah, and I think uh, Dar I think Darwin actually posited that yeah. the lung evolved from the yeah. swim bladder, but yeah, he had it a little bit backwards. The lung came first, or well, out pocketings of the esophagus came first, and then the lungs evolved from that, and then. You got your, um, and so then it became a highly vascularized gas bladder in right. like gars and and bow fins, and then and completely you, closed off in the uh, in the teleosts. 
And you have to also bear in mind that even without like a uh, just the esophagus or at least close to the to the area, it's a it's also a very very thin skin. So there are still some right. gas exchange, and 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 that, that little bit of gas exchange can be still be very helpful. And that can only and the only thing to increase it is just to yeah form an out pocket of the esophagus to increase the surface area. Right. Right. Exactly. Right. And so. Um... Yeah, lung or sorry, coelacanths. They uh, have turned theirs into a vestigial lung. They're not using. They're primarily deep water, I think, and so they're not really using it for gulping air. Lungfish, as we know, hence their name, and then of course the tetrapods. So, yeah, I don't think there's also, there also some fish who cannot survive without breathing air, even. Yeah, right? um, yeah, mudskippers are actually at that point. They have to have periods where they can gulp air. Yeah, or they, they have to. They, they, they can't yeah, they, stay they all they over for long. Yeah, they will actually drown. So, yeah, fish that, In, fish that drown. Evolution, intelligent designs. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, we good on this one? Right. Yes. Okay, so, <coughs> all right. So the Sarcopterygii. Um, so that's uh, us. So exactly, the ray-finned fish and lobe-finned fish split somewhere probably in the late Silurian, and you get a, a radiation of lobe-finned fish in the Devonian, uh, Gogonesis, uh, Tristocopterus, Hineria, and then Florentia is an, is an actual lungfish and is a member of the Dipnoi. Yeah. And so, as part of that radiation of Sarcopterygians, you get the Eotetrapodiformes. Okay. Qu uh, uh, question real fast. Okay. I mean, after, after the, so at, but you know, probably later. But after the late, the after the late Devonian extinction, uh, the uh, we, all the only lobe fin fish in the seas is it would be the the two. Uh, I mean, the not, not two. Well, two now is the, would be the ancestors of the, what become the uh, the lungfish and the. Uh, Last remaining lobe fin fish that we talked about. And the coelacanths? Yeah, but, but probably before that, they're probably more uh, diverse. I think so. I think all of them except the, the lungfish and coelacanths got wiped out in that. Uh, I know it hit fish really hard. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, I think they were the only the only uh, still aquatic uh, sarcopterygians left. Yeah, but, that, the, but, the, but the the shark people and the... Whatever that... I can't... The, the, whatever that word is for the Rayfin fish group. This, oh, the Actinopterygians. Yeah, yeah, they yeah. They, they they like bloom back. <laughs> well, they didn't actually until the early Triassic. So the the Actinopterygii yeah. they have a radiation in the early Triassic, and I don't okay. remember why. Um, but that's that was them at that point. So, um, but yeah, interestingly, really, yeah, yeah. Do it. Oh, go ahead, sorry. I was oh, I was okay, just okay. saying that uh, like. I was just saying, like, even though to today the Actinopterygians are like the most predominant fish in the ocean, and now the right. lobe fish, well, at least the aquatic lobe fish, non tetrapod lobe fish, are uh, like very few in between. But it used to be the right. way around. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And um, yeah. yeah, you get just a cup. Yeah. Uh, there, the Actinopterygians are fairly uh, low diversity um, through. Uh, like from the Silurian through the end of the Paleozoic, and then yeah. I guess the 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 Sarcopterygians, the aquatic ones, took a number of hits, and this basically opened the playing field for yeah. the Actinopterygians to invade, and which they yeah. did. They're like, where does where does where do, where do those guys go on land? Oh, well, I guess this is our our territory now. Yeah. yeah, the thing about about that radiation of Sarcopterygians is what I'm willing to bet is probably a number of them were at least competent in navigating at least land for short stretches and so you get a bunch which are aquatic a few which have very slight land moving capabilities and then from that group you get the actual tetrapods so it's really just an extension of of a, a feature which already existed which i mean of course big surprise that because that's how evolution works you just keep tinkering with the things you already have so um, so of course you have Eustinopteron, Pandarichthys, Tiktolic, Acanthostega, Ichthyostega, Tularpaton. Tularpaton is kind of one of the, I think it's like the earliest um, actual tetrapod. I think. Well, may, or maybe it, a maybe just stem tetrapod, or, just or maybe just stem tetrapod. Yeah, something like that. It's it's really really close. 
but it's got six fingers rather than five. Oh, right. and, and unfortunately, it, it, everything between lungfish and living tetrapods have no have no descendants. Yep, they're all gone. All the uh, as they used to call them, the cross up pterygians, that that paraphyletic term. Yep, they're all gone. Um, yep. Yeah, oh yeah, twenty nineteen. So yeah, you have Parmastega, which is actually uh, morphologically intermediate between Tiktolic and Acanthostega. So this reminds me of um, of the uh, um, the the creationist cop out where it's like. You know, for every transitional fossil you find, uh, Dr. Banjo, isn't that his name? <laughs> the ban- he's the like, Banjo Dango. <laughs> yeah, he's like, you know, uh, uh, oh, aha, I have you now. Where's your transition oh, between I these got two? got you now. Yep, and so, you know, here it is. Now, oh, I, I can't, this, the Tiktaalik and Acanthostega? Aha, now there's another gap. Oh, well, I raised you Parmastega. Well, now there's another gap, you know, so, and so, uh, so there you go, folks. Uh, another transition to fill the increasing transition. Yeah, just like just like from w- the land whales, the sea whales, this, but this is the reverse. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so here is an experiment we actually talked about, uh, as Nestling knows, we talked about recently on on the channel. <clears throat> Developmental plasticity in the origin tetrapod. So this was a 2014 experiment where some bichers were raised on land or bashirs, however you pronounce it. I don't just let's go with the, the Latin polypterus. Some polypterus were raised on land. You know, when the Latin's easier, you're in bad shape. Um, these guys get raised on land uh, or a group of them, and they actually have an easier time moving on land thanks to developing slightly differently through their ontogeny than their than the control group, which was raised totally a, aquatic. So they actually develop more like Eusynopteron, you know, and other stem tetrapods, which is pretty neat. Yeah. So th- it-, it raises the possibility that developmental plasticity played a role there. Yeah. It's also like it's also one a very good instance of putting out that not everything not everything is about genes. It's also like the for the forces that the, the organism experiences during development that changes it. So so yeah, it's really neat. Mm-hmm. Yep. Pretty cool stuff. Okay. Oh, that's it, folks. Uh, that's all uh, for me. So uh, I know keeping it short, crazy world we live in. Yeah. So in that case, uh, Brian Brainbuck, do you have any slides or anything about the, the, the after parts of the Vonians? You want to talk oh, about? oh, no, I just I just came to, to learn today. Uh, so I appreciate that. Uh, uh, all right. I was hoping you had some. Uh, knowledge about that time period about you you, oh well uh i mean as far as arthropods i I guess i would kind of sprinkle it in when we were talking about the uh the other uh clades there with uh with jackson but uh there there were of course scorpions were were already around and uh well chelicerots were were fairly dominant as far as arthropods go uh, right up there with the uh, trilobites, of course, which we touched on with uh, with Jackson's slide. Uh, we had early uh, myriapods, uh, which are uh, millipedes and centipedes. Um, the most famous being Arthropleura, which is uh, the the huge, massive uh, uh, millipede of. Uh, it's more the Arthropleurids really came into their own in the Carboniferous, but they did first okay. appear in the in the Devonian. So we have, uh, we have them and we also have, uh, you know, several of the more, uh, basal insects as, uh, uh, the rhiny shirt. That's what I was asking about that before, because when I was researching this to find out about the, uh, about what kind of insects that we could expect to find, uh, during the earlier, uh, Devonian, uh, the, one that, that popped up the most was were the ones that were found in the rainy shirt. So, uh, and we have a lot of uh, other arthropods and lichens and al- algae and uh, fungi uh, that uh, appear in that same uh, that same formation. Oh, so, cool. Yeah. All right, so the Devonian was the uh, say the tetrapods transition from the water to the, to the land throughout the, the whole, probably, probably, probably throughout the entire Devonian. I'm guessing. 
Or is that was that more of a the the, the, the tetrapods? Yeah, that, was that more of a late Devonian? Or was that throughout the entire Devonian all that all that pro, all that step by step process? You like you said? Oh, that was pro, well. I mean, the actual. So it was thought originally that that transition took place in sort of the the late uh, uh, Devonian, but it seems that it was more sort of early to mid Devonian. Okay, when that was occurring. But 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 brain bugs people had been up up there for a little <laughs> bit longer before that. Well, I mean insects have, or arthropods have probably been on land since like the Ordovician. Yeah, so, there's yeah there, there's been uh, trackways dated yeah to the Ordovician uh, and yeah, even exactly. you know further back. Uh, we also we saw the end of the uh, like the uh, Radiodonta uh, during this period. So that was a a clay that had been fairly dominant throughout uh, all the early uh what since since the uh cambrian at least yeah the, uh, i think maybe a little bit back into the uh, ediacaran that we can see some radiodonta but uh yeah they were this was the it wasn't at the end of the uh, De devonian it was somewhere in the mid devonian when uh uh the placoderms really took over that uh, that you saw the end of these uh, these older uh, older clades. Uh -huh. All right, so yeah, so oh. I think yes, yeah, it's, it's, so like God, I can't talk. <laughs> You're fine. All right. So, uh, so uh, I was taking this picture of the the Zonian period. It's like the the, uh, the Zonian ended with uh, what's called the Flaminian glaciation. Yeah, as part of the the I mean the the Devonian extinction sort of took place in a series of steps because you had like the eutrophication and you had continual. Um, uh, what was the term for it? Uh, like weathering, I guess, of the and transportation downstream, and this process sort of continually built up until you got um, like glaciation as an end result. Yep. Uh, right, so how come there? So how come nothing? I can there's nothing that I think I uh, Colton mentioned, uh, Mr. Wilford mentioned a little bit in this thing, but how come there was no time but big die-offs between the the, the Silurian and the Devonian. I mean, it's really just as simple as you had a long stretch of Earth history that had no major climatic shift or, a, you know, no impact, no mass volcanism. And so, you know, geologists don't tend to like to leave a period as being that long. So they were like, well, we got to draw a divide somewhere for consistency's sake. And so they just decided that since you've already got this well-known micro um, uh, graptolite stratigraphy, you may as well okay. just find a good point to draw it. Are the rocks different from the time two time periods, or are they the same? Um, they're a little bit different, but it's uh, it's more of a gradation between the two types than it is any sort of sharp divide. Okay. You, know, so, you start. You start. You start just gradually seeing, like again, the emergence of land, plants, and things having their impact. You know, soils become more common, that sort of thing. So, kind of like between the 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 Jurassic and the Cretaceous, nothing. Mm, exactly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, folks. No major deaths there. Just. It's okay. Mm. They made up for it at the end of the Devonian. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> If I if I can you can you show the time screen sharing from Dalian? Uh, I I looked something up and uh, okay. there were there are only only a couple of things that we didn't uh, cover yet, which I found. There was like a, a very interesting group of uh, extinct arachnids called the Trigo no Tarbida, if I pronounce correctly, and Sounds they are like little. Yeah, it's a. Uh, 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 like, what, what are their closest living relatives? Let's see. Um, mm, I, maybe it's somewhere. It says somewhere here. What does but, it say? Uh, they are, of course, Eric Nida. So, I did it. There there they are on there. I don't yeah. know. Let's see. Let's see here. Oh, uh, mm. uh, so let's see. True, oh, they are true arachnids. 
they are maybe closely related to like uh, a Reich, Reich, an obscure group of uh, uh, Arachnids. <laughs> Rich Resinula, is that what that says? Yes, Resinula, yes. So not they are, not close to like any of the any of the are, normal they are, arachnids. Uh, they, are close, hey, they, uh, they are close to spiders. They are close to spiders. Please. Feature ideas for for brain bugs. The well, in Opilion's uh, Harvestmen do kind of look like uh, there's and there's a wide variety of of Harvestmen that, that more than just the daddy long legs that we see. You know, in the rural U.S., but uh, shorter legs, more robust bodies, heavier built. Uh, some of them even get as uh, to looking like ambly pigeons being so robust. Oh, oh. T- zoom it a little too much zooming in. I mean, I, I maybe I can just click on the image. So let's see here. There we go. And they look they look like giant ticks or mice. Yeah. these things. They look like ticks. Or, uh, and like I don't know how large they are. Yeah. An interesting thing about the uh, the uh, centipedes of of this era is that uh, they had big compound eyes. Uh, hmm. The uh, modern ones have these tiny ossicles, which they just except for the house centipedes still have big compound eyes, but uh, like. Uh, all the, the orders that got so huge uh, during the uh, the Devonian and into the Carboniferous all had these big compound eyes, and a lot of the uh, other arthropods did as well. Uh, something they didn't really do as well on land later. Yeah, so I like, other parts have a very interesting uh, diversity back then. Like some of them are just extinct; we don't have any more like these guys. That's another another thing that I found. There's actually a transitional plant fossil called R- Runcaria. Whoa. And this. Hmm? So, whoa. Yeah. It's, uh, it's a transitional fossil but, uh, for uh, a precursor to seeds. So, it's basically an incomplete seed plant. And of course, later, I think it at the, at the t- tail end of the volume, or maybe just at the beginning of the Carboniferous. That's when you have proper seed plants begin, uh, beginning to appear. But yeah, very interesting. Awesome. So, and, and that, those are the things that I have uh, found uh, so far. Just, I, to, just to fill in the gaps. Nice. So, I was wondering, like this, all these different eons, eras, periods, epochs, and and ages. So where in this, where would the transition hap- of the thing of the tetrapod happen on, on, on here? Was that time. was like, uh, I think that was Fresnian. Okay. So I think it was, or no, or maybe it was Iphelian. Uh, I, th- I think it like- depends on where you, yeah, it depends on where you begin. Like if you begin the tetrapod morphs, like the split between the longfish and uh, tetrapods, maybe earlier, like in, at the lower yeah. end of the Devonian. Probably. Early to mid Devonian is where the tetrapod transition is taking place. Okay. Because yeah. you see, you get guys like Ichthyostega and Acanthostega showing up in the late Devonian. Okay. All, all the, right the, around the time that the, the radiodontids and stuff started disappearing too, because they couldn't compete uh, as, in those major predator issues. The, and the tetrapod uh, uh, tra- trackways uh, when they were also like at the uh, the lower they were found right or at the middle. The yeah, I think it was. Trackways. It was like, um, yeah, I think it was. It was like it was early Devonian. I think it was like towards the end of the. It was later early okay, Devonian. Yeah. So I, I think it's three hundred ninety years ago. Like something. Yeah. Right? So something I always like wonder that. these. I, I always wonder these things because like 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 we like talked about before after the. Uh, Cretaceous, we start breaking things down into epochs and ages. But before th- that, everything's everything's stuck in one period. Or before well, they that, do, they still do that. Yeah, no, you can they still, can still break if you down. if you look if you go to Wikipedia, for instance, they will give you the index fossil associated with every okay. epoch. Yeah, it's actually it's really cool. Okay, so. yeah. Uh, um, so, uh, guys, uh, before uh, before you get in, into a new topic here, I just got I got to actually go. Thanks uh, for having me on, though. Hey, no problem. Uh, no problem. Uh, been fun, guys. I, I will I will also go. Uh, thanks for having yeah. me. Yeah.
Yeah, it's okay. probably, it's like 3 a.m. where you live right now. <laughs> yeah. Bye-bye. Bye. See ya. Bye, nice look. Bye, brain bug. Bye. All right. I, yeah. yeah. I guess we'll just call it. We've been over an hour, huh? Yeah, like, like I said, I was wondering about that. So, like, so, like I said, since the, you know, we don't talk about the the earlier stages and stuff when earlier like like pre-cambrian we were more like eras and eons <laughs> mm-hmm. well you're also dealing with much vaster time scales at that True. point i mean you can still break it down farther you can get into like the um because you have the neo-proterozoic or you have the proterozoic right then you get into like the neo-proterozoic and then within that you have like you know the the tony and the cryogenian and the ediacaran and Blah blah blah. And like 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 so for the longest time it was it was it was, it was Cambrian above everything everything else was pre Cambrian. <laughs> like, well, I mean, yeah, because you have you have, it's just such a you have like three fourths of Earth's history or four fifths really is just pre Cambrian, and then suddenly, you know, the stuff that's interesting to us all starts happening within the last like fifth of Earth's history. So. <laughs> We're, we're, we're just time racist i guess <laughs> i mean we're we're anthropocentric yeah we're you know so that we're we look at things like oh there was the origin of life and then you just follow it up and eventually it ends at humans there we are so you know speed things all right so let's wrap it up i guess so so do you have anything so jackson you have anything coming up besides your long long uh look at the darwin's storybook uh, Looks not works. really. Um, I'm just, I have, I haven't even finished the next script. Um, I'm most of the way through it though. So just, yeah. just working on it and I working on, uh, the rocks were there every so often. Oh yeah. So. You, 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 yeah. You, how, how much, how many more episodes till we get to the, uh, actual living things now, the chimpanzees and bonobo tales. Oh, oh. in um, in the ancestors tale series, we've still got like, <laughs> Like three or four, because let's see, what's next? What are we doing? The Habilene's tale is next. Oh, sorry, the Handyman's whatever. Right. Then it's Artie's tale. Oh, so so we're still we're still in, we're still in the homos. <laughs> we're, um, yes, that yeah. Then I think the next one is the last hominin, and then okay, so really it's three. So, okay. uh, the Handyman's tale, Artie's tale, and then the Chimp's tale. So, yep, nice. We're getting close. We're getting close to leaving. The hominins finally. I mean, I had like four episodes just on humans, so just on you know Homo sapiens. So yeah, it, it's gonna take a, a while to get anywhere. Uh, have you learned anything? That you even have you learned anything that you haven't learned? I just talk. Have you learned anything that you didn't know by, by reviewing this again? Oh have yeah. Learned- um, the way Dawkins presents some information is he kind of hints at stuff. He's like there's some debate over this idea and then I'll go look up the technical literature on that thing. And I read about what the debate is and all that sort of stuff. And then I get to learn about the different sides of that uh, debate. Um, For instance, like um, with language, he very briefly touches on language uh, in, in the ancestors tale. And part of the reason is, is it's such a contentious field um, and so we just kind of mentioned, uh, was it universal uh, grammar theory? Um, and that was, and just a couple other little things with like uh, signaling, but not much. Um, language itself would have to be like a whole nother series. It's just vast. Yeah. Linguistics is a vast, vast field. Oh, definitely. Uh, so what about you, Mr. Wilford? Are you are you going for your PhD in, in geology or? <laughs> Not at this point, but we are still shooting for that bachelor's. I'm uh I'm I don't have anything coming up right now because I am neck deep in schoolwork at this point. So that's got most of my attention. Uh, you, Jackson, you still work on your bachelor's, or you are you on your master's now? Well, I got my bachelor's last December, so yeah, I'm working on my ah. on my master's. That's what I'm doing. My my or going to start working on my thesis project in the near future. So. Uh, nice. You're going right. to have, gonna have your, your thesis out there pretty soon for everyone to read. Um, 
Yeah, it's probably going to be like another year. But I mean, the hope is, I guess, eventually, you know, it'll be out there. So. And then we're going to start calling you Master Jackson, Master Wheat. Please don't. Let's not call me that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. All right. Well, well, thanks for thanks thanks for guys for being on. No thanks for having us. You know, I love that if we could if we could schedule this. If I I love to have at least uh, once uh, one day a mo- one one week in a month that we could do it do this breakdown of, of, of each period. Yeah, right? absolutely. Right. I'm we, always we call, down for that. We can call we can call the uh, the geology paleontology error uh, week uh, hour. <laughs> right. Call yeah. It. I mean, yeah. As long as there's life involved, we can have Jackson talk about that, and we can get into like some Precambrian geology. I'm sure that would be cool. Nice. Yeah, I mean, yeah. It de- we'd have it. Really, would depend on the time period because if we pick like far enough back, I'm like, here's some bacteria they found yeah. once. Yeah, I, I think I think it. probably anything anything pa- pre. I'm guessing anything pre uh, Ediacaran would probably be more. Single, single, yeah, that would well, just be geology. Yeah. Well, you can actually, there are some finds that go back to about a billion years ago, but once you go past a billion, then it gets really, uh, you're really stretching it. It's like, so okay, this is like basically, oh, this is the big, uh, basically for that, this, like, oh, this is the big, uh, uh, protozoic, edi- edi- oh, I can't, I can't, not protozoic, uh, pro- prokaryote. E- Ecokaryote split. <laughs> That's the big thing that happened then. It was probably yeah, that was I, about two billion years ago. This yeah. is probably a story you're going to get to eventually, and in, in your I think it's one of the stories you probably get to eventually in your story in your tales. Uh, interestingly, so Dawkins doesn't really do a tale on. He has a chapter where he where it's just on um, the last common ancestor of eukaryotes. Yeah, I think but he doesn't the, have it. I think he. I think if I remember correctly, it's like. It's like uh, the backwards forward te- backwards forward thing the forward i forget how he said it cuz well uh, i mean he, I th- he doesn't have a tail for it is is what i mean yeah yeah he just uh he just has a a little chapter where he discusses it so we won't have a tale about it we'll discuss it i'm sure but sort of in passing yeah i think the like closest thing tell he has is the uh the mega mega thick mega Nicotricrius. You're talking about the the Mixatrix tale? Yeah, that's it. Oh, the well, the Mixatrix was um. So that's about um. Oh frick, uh, endosymbiosis like within endosymbiosis because he talks about the well very briefly. The Mixatrix tale is about so you have this termite, Mastotermes darwiniensis, which is named after Darwin, Australia, not Charles Darwin. Um, although the city, I don't actually. Know, I don't know if the city itself is named after Darwin, but regardless, uh, or after that Darwin, but you have Mastotermes darwiniensis, and within it, uh, because they eat wood, and termites can't digest the uh, cellulose and lignin in the wood, so they have a protist, which lives in their gut, and that's uh, Mixotrica paradoxa. And then Mixotrica paradoxa has these two uh, bacteria living on it and it looks like it has cilia but it doesn't uh uh it looks like it has cilia on it but it's actually shut up colton um a spirochete bacterium which is attached to another bacterium which is attached to the mixatrix and they're providing the motion for uh for the the mixatrix and so it's pretty neat it's it's this like turtles all the way down sort of stuff, and we'll get so. to it. But see, in like in like sixty more chapters, like sixty more. Yeah, stories. honestly, yeah, it's like fifty five <laughs> or so chapters away. It's a long time. We're, it's gonna take a while to get there. Probably like in two thousand twenty four. Well, I hope it doesn't take that long, but it'll be a little while. Yes. All right. Well, all right. Uh, Jackson, say your closing phrase, and I'll say mine. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time. Yep. And as I always say, never stop learning. You better not enjoy the randomness. We'll see you. We'll see you then.